may be seated. As you are, just a few things to share with you before I begin the message this morning. First of all, we have a special guest with us today. Pastor Camille Pook is right over there. (laughs) Recovering well from her foot surgery, it's good to have her back with us, but uh, what it reveals to us is that we have a platform that is not as accessible as perhaps it could be. And so that means it's very difficult to have uh, Pastor Camille get up here in front and be with you. So if you want to come say hello to her afterwards, please come do that and give her your blessing. I know she would be uh, rejoiced. She loves her family, but she really is tired of seeing them. And so she's very excited to see other people. So please come and welcome her after worship today. Just real quick, I wanted to show you a couple pictures from yesterday from the extravaganza. And uh, first of all, you've never seen more pizza in your life than in that picture right there. That was what we fed everybody with. And uh, then uh, this is everybody in the hall after the Easter egg hunt. We had well over 250 here yesterday for the extravaganza, and it was a beautiful day. It went really well. We had just a real team effort on the part of everyone um, on our staff and our leadership and volunteers in the life of our church. Just so thankful for everyone who was here to share in that time together, and we had a great day. We had, I brought yesterday morning donuts for everybody who was volunteering, but they hardly ate any. So that's why you have donuts this morning, all right? So enjoy those while they last, all right? Enjoy them while they last. So it was a fantastic day yesterday morning and very, uh, very blessed to be a part of it, and we're excited to have so many families from the North Queen Anne Child Care join us. We've invited all of them to come join in worship with us on Easter Sunday morning. And so let's be in prayer this week. Let's be in prayer for all those families in our North Queen Anne child care. So many of whom do not have any church home. Many of whom do not know Jesus Christ. And just pray that God would tug on their hearts and invite them into this place next week so that they might hear a saving message of Jesus Christ as they come together for worship next Sunday. So I hope you'll agree to be in prayer with me for them as uh, we hope that they come next week. So as many of you know, I just finished teaching a class at Seattle Pacific University, and part of the class that I have to lead for that group contains a little segment on vocation. And so we get to talk about vocation and what they're thinking about for the future of their lives and how they might think about that in a spiritual and a theologically centered sort of way. And one of the frameworks I offer to them to begin thinking about how they might do this is I describe these three different words for them. And this is what I shared with them during the last couple weeks of class. I share it with you today because it has to do with what the message today is about. I talked to them about the career that they might have later in their life, whatever that might be or whatever that might become. Career is what you do, and sometimes I even phrase that as career is what you end up doing. (laughs) All right? And sometimes that career is not necessarily what we planned, but in my experience as a local church pastor for over 30 years now, I've come across person after person after person who has been in a career that has been completely unfulfilling to them. Careers that did not use their gifts, their calling in any way. They just simply found a way to make a living, to do the best they could to provide financially for their family, but they were really unfulfilled by all of that work. That's a career. But if you go a little bit deeper in thought and self-reflection, you might begin thinking about a vocation. And vocation is where you start asking questions about how you're aligned. How do my gifts, my capacities, my skills, my talents, how do those come together and feed how I see my life and how I'm at work? And beginning to think about what capacities that individuals have is an important part of vocation. Of course, the word vocation literally means calling, so it might be redundant with the word calling, but I wanted to tease it apart just for the purpose of our conversation with our students. So How could they think about what are their skills? What are the talents they have? What are the things they're already doing today that can become foundations for them as they move forward in their life and lead them perhaps into a very fulfilling career, whatever that might be? But then there's a third level, a third level that invites a level of self-reflection and authenticity that I was really trying to invite them to consider, and that's calling. And the question there that we're trying to answer is, why are you here? Why are you here? What kind of purpose does your life have? Why are you taking up space? Why are you breathing oxygen? Why is it that you, the uniqueness that you are, 
are here at this moment in time to be and to do the very thing that God may be inviting you to do with your life? That's a deeper question. And see, with each one of those three words, it invites us to think about authenticity at different levels, starting, of course, with career, then vocation, then calling. This journey toward authenticity is an important one because it forms the basis of how we understand our lives, and in every way, it's the foundation of how we relate to God. And today, I want to talk with you about authenticity. And in this passage that's become very familiar to those of us within the Christian community, one of the passages we read from the Gospels for Palm Sunday, in this case, Matthew chapter 21. This is a passage about authenticity. It's about the authenticity of Jesus. And it's about the, the falsehood and even the imposters that he confronts beginning on this very day, Palm Sunday, when we commemorate his entrance into the city of Jerusalem that ultimately will come to Good Friday and his betrayal leading to his death and crucifixion. So let's talk about authenticity this morning and explore what it might mean for us to think about these at a deeper level. The first thing I'd suggest to you is this, is that authenticity is always a risk. Authenticity is always a risk. Jesus, as he arrives uh, near the city of Jerusalem, he uh, holds up on Saturday night, maybe even a few days before that, as he ascended the mountains from the east, from the Jordan River Valley through the city of Jericho, up to the top near the Mount of Olives. And right before you summit the Mount of Olives, which is really kind of a glorified hill, if you will, uh, there's two towns on the opposite side, the eastern side of that ridge from Jerusalem. One is Bethphage and the other is Bethany. And that's where Jesus has taken up residence. And this is actually where he'll stay every single night when he comes in and out of Jerusalem all week until Thursday, in which he does not return to Bethany. He only leaves the city to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, Jesus is there in Bethphage, and then he, on that first Palm Sunday morning, came over the top of the Mount of Olives riding on a donkey, and then he begins a very steep descent down a hill into the bottom of a valley, which is called the Kidron Valley, and then up through the east gate of the city of Jerusalem. Now, what in the world does this have to do with authenticity? Because this is Jesus' authentic moment. He, he rides a donkey, which Scripture says that the Messiah would ride when he enters the city of Jerusalem. It's a humble beast, and we'll talk about that in a moment. He enters the city through the east gate, which is the gate through which the Messiah was supposed to enter the city of Jerusalem. As he goes down this steep hill, the crowd is gathered. They're waving branches around, and they're throwing their cloaks on the ground. The cloaks on the ground is a signal of their submission to his leadership and his rule. The waving of palm branches is the equivalent of waving an American flag at a 4th of July parade. The waving of branches in the air is a symbol of Jewish nationalism. Go Israel is what it means as he enters the city. They shout Hosanna. They shout, shout blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The word Hosanna means save us. Save us. So literally as he's entering into the city, they're shouting out to him, save us. So they're bringing all of their language and all of their gestures and everything. And notice that Jesus isn't having one of those moments we're used to hearing about in other parts of the gospel, where Jesus would tell all of his followers, shh, don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration. Don't tell anyone about the miracle I did. Don't tell anyone about being healed from blindness. No, Jesus enters the city full well knowing what he's doing, and allowing fully the crowd to engage. It's an authentic moment. He literally comes to the city as their Messiah. And he doesn't stop them. Matter of fact, in Luke's gospel, it tells us a story about how during this parade, as he's entering the city of Jerusalem, there were those there who were telling his disciples to be quiet. And Jesus says, no, no, let them shout, because if they don't shout, the rocks will cry out. Jesus wants it to be known what's happening but it's always a risk. It's always a risk. He knows exactly what he's doing. He knows exactly why he's doing it. And he knows exactly what it means. Oftentimes we feel the same risks when it comes to our own life and our own faith. Finding spaces to be safely known is difficult. Finding spaces to be safely known is difficult. All of us have at different points in our lives have suffered the trauma 
of being too open, too transparent, too authentic with people, and we've been hurt by that. We've been betrayed by that. We've been wounded or injured by that. And so sometimes it becomes much more, um, how shall we say, easy to hold ourselves from any degree of intimacy or authenticity because we perceive it to be safe. But really what we're called to do as followers of Jesus is to practice this kind of authenticity, this kind of openness, where we seek out and find communities where we can be true and honest and engaged with one another. We're getting ready in our church in the next couple of months to launch a series of small groups that are built around the development of spiritual intimacy and discipleship together. And oftentimes those small groups will try to move in the direction of becoming Bible studies, or they'll move in the direction of trying to be prayer groups, all of which are virtuous activities. But in some ways, in those settings and at those times, they become a way to avoid intimacy. Isn't it easier to just show up in a group and let someone tell you about the Bible? Safe. Finding spaces to be safely known is hard. And after spending two plus years in a pandemic, it's even harder. So as the church tries to move out of the season of the pandemic, the global church does, there's a deep hunger for people to be in community, but they're not so sure. There's a hunger to be in deep community, but they're not so sure. All of this, combined with the age in which we live, this post-secular age, we're faced with a real dilemma. See, in the secular age, people of faith were considered to be, you know, benign, somewhat of a novelty. But in the post-secular age, people of faith are hostile. They're a threat. Their judgmentalism and their fundamentalism is a threat to the social order. So Christians and even other religious traditions are experiencing a form of, of nascent marginalization that's beginning to occur because of the time in which we live. And so how much more important is it for us to find ways to do exactly what we say we do? To do exactly what we say we do. Find these pathways to authenticity. Brene Brown, the teacher and a preacher and theologian, says this, because true belonging only happens when we present our authentic, imperfect selves to the world. Our sense of belonging can never be greater than our level of self-acceptance. Being true to who we are and who God made us to be is, is the, the, the very essence of authenticity. And so some questions we might want to ask ourselves, two of them I would suggest we reflect on maybe this week. What settings often cause you to hide in plain sight? And what relationship or setting needs your authenticity now more than ever? Well, being authentic is always a risk, but the theological piece of this is that authenticity is God's playing field. Authenticity is the place where, where God does the work, where God moves, where God speaks, where God acts. The crowd may not fully realize that their celebration on Palm Sunday was an engagement into God's playing field. So Jesus comes into this very public space. There's no secrecy anymore. Everything's out in the open. And God is at work in that moment, Jesus being fully who he is. Sir Isaac Newton said, There are more sure marks of authenticity in the Bible than any other profane history. <laughs> I love this statement so much because what we read about in the Bible again and again and again in every single character who's led by the Spirit of God and ultimately and fantastically revealed in Jesus Christ is the power of authenticity. And that when we stand in the place of truly being ourselves, exactly how God made us to be, and we present that to the world and to the community around us, that's the place where God meets us. God is at work in this very moment in Jesus' life as he enters the city of Jerusalem. But it's like lighting a fuse. Once it starts, there's no going back. As we like to say in my house, the toothpaste is out of the tube, and there's no way to put it back. You see, authenticity is the only place where God truly moves and works in our life. 
And when God is moving outside of our authentic self, the only thing God is doing is drawing us into our authentic self. And so everything in our life that is kind of sham or pretense or facade, whatever it is we put up in front of other people that we think is what we want to present versus who we really are, God is actually trying to strip that away so that we can become the very people that God says we are. It really harkens us back to the story of creation in the Garden of Adam and Eve. Are we all cool just being naked? Or do we suddenly have a moment of shame and don't want our true selves revealed? Of course, my friends, naked is a metaphor here. <laughs> right. Hmm. This is the space where God wants to move and work in our lives. You know, I, I hear oftentimes that we just don't see God move the way God used to move. We don't see the healings we used to see. We don't see the miracles we used to see. We don't, receive, we don't see the revivals that we used to see. You know, there's a re revival that occurred at Asbury University just a few weeks ago that you probably read about or heard about. And even here in Seattle, people were praying that a revival like that would break out in, in Seattle. But something we learn about every great revival throughout the church, especially in Protestant history, is that no revival happens without repentance. Repentance is the first act of authenticity. It is the return to who we are. It's a stepping away from our sin, our falsehood, the lies which we tell ourselves and the lies in which we tell others. And that act of repentance is the very fertile soil that God uses to sprout up revival. And so, brothers and sisters, I would suggest to us all that we will not see these great signs. We will not see these great movements. We will not see great revival unless we repent. I didn't say it. Charles Spurgeon said it. John Wesley said it. The great revivalist leaders of the last 200 years have said the same thing. Authenticity is God's playing field. And there's only one way to get on that field. Repentance. A turning of our hearts and lives over to God. So some questions for us to wonder about here. Where is God at work in your life today? And how does that work invite more authenticity? And how can you find time and space to meet God without presumptions and constraints, freely and openly? I, I'd encourage you during this Holy Week to find a way to set aside some time, five minutes or ten minutes, where you sit with God and you say nothing. You sit with God and say nothing. And it's constructive time. You sit and plant yourself and say, okay, God, I am here, and I'm not going to say a word for ten minutes. And see where you go. See what journey the Spirit of God might take you, inward and outward, about what in life maybe needs to shift or change. Well, finally, authenticity does one last thing. Authenticity exposes falsehood and imposters. <coughs> Jesus enters the city at the beginning of Passover. Now, Passover will start on Thursday evening. He comes into the city on a Sunday. And as he comes into the city on Sunday, the city has already started making its preparations for the festival of the Passover. The Passover is the commemoration of the exodus of the Jewish people from slavery in Egypt. It's like their 4th of July. Nationalism runs high. The notion of being independent as Jewish people runs high. All of these things are tilted to a fever pitch. The problem is, throughout all of the Judean countryside and the ancient world, the Jews do not have their independence. Who rules over them? The Romans rule over them. And here's where the authenticity begins to work to expose falsehood and imposters. What we learn in a fantastic book I read a number of years ago called Rome and Jerusalem. It's written by Martin Goodman. He talks about what happened every year at Passover. And Goodman describes that at Passover, on Sunday, a Roman garrison would arrive from Caesarea Maritima. That's the headquarters of the Roman governor of the region. 
And the Roman governor would leave from Caesarea Maritima and then march to the city of Jerusalem with a very large garrison of Roman soldiers, all mounted on stallions, walking in order, infantrymen, centurions, all coming into the city because in They wanted to ensure that if the Jews got any idea about having an uprising during Passover, they would flex Roman power so they wouldn't do so. And so what Goodman describes is that that garrison would arrive in Jerusalem, you'll never guess on what day, the Sunday before Passover. And so at the very same time Jesus is riding down from the Mount of Olives on his little donkey, coming into the city of Jerusalem, The Romans are coming into the city of Jerusalem with their stallions and with their organized marches into the city at the same time. So the city of Jerusalem has a choice. The choice is, is do we align with empire or do we align with Jesus? Friday morning at 7 o'clock that week, they will make their choice. Crucify him. That's their choice. You see, authenticity, when it's lived out purely like the way Jesus does, it exposes everything. It's like light shining in a dark place. The Romans want to flex their power, and Jesus is flexing his power. And they collide in the city. It says in the Gospel of Matthew, the story we read, that the city was stirred when Jesus came into town. It's the same Greek word for earthquake. So stirred really doesn't do it justice. Do you understand why the city is in such upheaval? Here's Jesus entering the city. Here's the Romans entering the city. Everyone's trying to negotiate their space. What are we going to do? Who are we going to be? How's it going to work? Is it my career? Is it what I end up doing? Is it my vocation where I might have some gifts? Is it my calling, my authentic calling, the thing I have to do and be? That's what's going on. Such a powerful moment for Jesus. The best and most effective way to confront falsehood and imposters isn't to throw rocks at them, my friends. It's to live authentically. As followers of Jesus, that kind of behavior is God-honoring and a grounded heart. Some questions for you to wonder about this week. What tough situation in your life today invites you to be even more authentic? And where does your life need a touch from God's Spirit for a more authentic form of trust. You see, calling is a matter of purpose, and that can only be addressed in an environment of authenticity, honesty, and the places in which we can find that, internal and external. Sometimes it's easy to be authentic. Sometimes it's very difficult, almost impossible. So our witness in a relative and untruthful world is to live in authenticity and openness and faith because doing so exposes falsehood and imposters. Talk, let's all talk less about being authentic. And instead, why don't we live it more? Why don't we do exactly what we say we do? Love people. Connect to Jesus. Serve the world. That's what we do. And I believe God's beckoning us to a time where we do more of that and talk less about it. Remember, all the words we say explain what we do. The words themselves don't take the place of doing it. I'm going to invite Pastor Sebignon to come and lead us in Holy Communion. As he does, let's just join for a few moments of silent prayer.